Sky. Kia ora koutou, e kai whakahare te pūpuri o te kāwanatanga au, e mahi ana au ki te rua mahara o te kāwanatanga, ko Anthony Moss toko i ngoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Tony Moss. I'm Director of Government Record Keeping at uh, Archives New Zealand uh, here in the Department of Internal Affairs. Um, so welcome uh, to what we hope will be the first of a new series of ongoing engagement uh, forums that uh, we intend uh, to hold. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with uh, Karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, he hi aki ana te hata kura, he tio, he huka, he hohunga, haumie, uie. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning, everyone, all 227 of you and counting. That's a good turnout. Um, yesterday, we had a uh, session with your executive sponsors. Uh, and today, we're talking to the information management uh, professionals. Um, we thought we'd um, dedicate sessions to the respective groups so that we could uh, you know, get our executive sponsors in, in the room and they can be free and frank and you can be free and frank uh, today with, uh, with them in your, in your questions and in our presentation. Um, we wanted to focus on the executive sponsors as the key people around the uh, leadership tables in uh, regulated organisations. But of course, you're the, uh, you're the professionals and you're the people who uh, do the work. So just a bit of housekeeping um, before we begin. Um, we have uh, a team monitoring uh, Q&A and chat box. Can I ask you if you have questions that are arising from the presentation that you want to have answered or discussed, put those in the Q&A. Uh, and if you've got chat, well, put the chat in the chat box. So a bit of a distinction uh, there. Um, do, do put your hand up in the chat if you are having problems with sound. We had a bit of echo yesterday, but I think it's okay now. Um, we'll try to answer your questions in this session, uh, but of course, anything we don't get through in the session, we'll, we'll follow up with uh, afterwards. Um, we also intend to, uh, we are recording this session, so we intend to put, um, uh, put the recording and also the slides up uh, probably on our website and make them available to participants uh, after, the, after the session. Um, so uh, the program this morning, uh, it's a slight variation uh, from, from what was advertised. Unfortunately, Stephen Clark, uh, our chief archivist, is, is unwell today. So I'm going to uh, present his presentation uh, on his behalf. It's the, the first presentation. Then we'll move on to um, our Director Holdings and Discovery at Archives, Polly Martin, who will talk to you about our Māori metadata project. After that, um, we'll move to Joanne Cotterman, and she's our principal advisor, of government information here at Archives, and she'll talk about our ontology uh, work. So, three um, fairly meaty, um, meaty topics. We hope uh, we had thought about talking about our uh, uh, one of our other major projects, uh, which is looking at appraisal and disposal and implementation thereof, and how we can address those problems. But that'll probably probably be something for our next, uh, next session. Um, the presentations will take about 10 minutes each. And what we'll do is push all the, uh, the Q&A, the uh, questions uh, to the end of the hour, um, rather than intersperse them between the sessions. So please do fire those questions into the Q&A as, as we go. Um, just let me check my run sheet. I think I've said everything I need to say. So what I'll do now is uh, I won't pretend to be Stephen. I won't try the accent or anything, but I'll, I'll deliver a, a presentation uh, on um, some of the key findings that we've, uh, we've got out of our uh, annual survey and uh, those key findings uh, detailed in our survey report, but have also been uh, advertised, as it were, in our recent uh, State of Government record keeping uh, report. So just a reminder, this, um, this slide is probably um, 
preaching to the choir, but uh, it was in there yesterday, perhaps for some of your executive sponsors who might be new, new to role. And, um, you know, just a reminder that um, what Archives New Zealand does, um, sometimes the word archives will, will sort of mislead people and people will think of the old stuff. Um, that's correct, of course, uh, but it's only partly right. And as you know, um, and sorry to labor the point, um, you know, if you look at the Public Records Act, um, you'll be reminded uh, that Archives New Zealand uh, regulates uh, government information management and uh, helps you manage uh, the current, and we manage the memory of government, and uh, that's for accountability and heritage purposes. So just a bit of a, a bit of a reminder there of the business that we're in. Um, our annual record keeping survey is a is a key uh, regulatory tool for for Archives New Zealand, and we hope for you to understand um, sector performance, the sector of agencies that we regulate. It's the basis uh, for understanding information management maturity, and therefore where our resources our resources, your resources might go to, to uh, get improvements in the system. What I'll do today is, is run through some of the key indicators that we derive from, from survey data. Uh, as I said, these were outlined briefly in our earlier uh, State of Government Record Keeping Report, the full survey findings report and, uh, and the associated data will be released uh, next week uh, if everything goes to plan publish the report and the data goes on data.gov.nz. Um, so this is reporting on the 2021 survey completed in uh, late, uh, uh, sorry, in June uh, 2021. It's the third survey in a row where we've had a, a consistent set of, of questions with only minor uh, variations across the years to try to get a consistent data set over time. Um, and we do, of course, add the occasional annual um, bonus questions in there. So who was surveyed? Um, well, first of all, thank you, because it was probably you uh, out there who were surveyed or who had to complete the responses uh, to the survey. Um, we, you know, we realise that the, the work uh, largely will fall on the IM professionals out in, in, uh, in agencies, so we hope you think it's a, it's a worthwhile uh, contribution to make to our and your wider understanding of the issues that, that you're, you're grappling with. Um, so a pretty good um, response rate in last year's survey, 84%. That's, that's not bad at all. Um, we, we tend to be fairly ruthless with the cutoff date. Uh, so apologies to those of you who've got a response in a little bit late. We tend to have to... Uh, cut those uh, responses off uh, so we can get on with the analysis. Some of you too might have uh, had to um, draft a response to a ministerial reminder about completing the survey. So our minister is very keen to assist um, the uh, chief archivist in his uh, statutorily independent role. So she, she leapt in, uh, Honourable Jan Tanetti, to, to write to the agencies and central government who, um, or to their ministers who hadn't responded to the survey. So. Thank you again if you had to write the response to that ministerial letter. Um, just, just an indicator that um, you know, our minister is very keen to support uh, what you and we are, what are trying to do. Um, so let's have a look at some key indicator graphs. Um, first one's about information management governance groups. Um, we'll start, start with a quote from someone else. The Auditor General actually has said, that um, poor record keeping governance is often an indicator of a culture of poor governance throughout an organization. It's a canary in the coal mine for organizational performance. Um, so we're always very keen to uh, um, back each other up between us and the, the Auditor General. We absolutely agree with that, with that comment, of course. Uh, put positively, uh, having uh, information management governance structures in the right uh, place in your organization can help you get, get effective information management by design rather than by chance or by uh, relying on the you know a few determined information management pre pre professionals uh, such as yourselves hammering away at it within organizations 
So we think um, you know information governance structures, something formal, something where you can go to uh, gives you gives you support uh, to work with your executive sponsor to to shift the way organisations uh, view information management. Um, so the results uh, indicate uh, a little bit of an improvement. That's good uh, in the number of uh, organisations with uh, dedicated information management governance between uh, 1920 and 2021. Uh, that, that is a good improvement. Um, and um, next steps for us on that area will, will be um, putting on our to-do list just to have a look at what, what is the picture of what good governance uh, for information management could be uh, in organisations and is there anything we can do to make that um, uh, clearer to, to agencies through, through models or, or other, uh, other uh, templates that we could possibly offer. So that's good. Green. Green improving box on the top left hand corner. Um, next key indicator is um, one I think probably dear to your hearts information management staff levels. Um, we take the, the rough and ready uh, measure of, an, of the number and presence of specialist information management staff. Um, compared to organizational size, measured by staff numbers, to be an important indicator. Um, the survey findings um, between years uh, have, have been uh, stable, relatively stable in this, in this indicator. Um, stable is probably not good enough. So um, the, the graphic there on the screen uh, is trying to tell, tell the story uh, of organizational size, the little skyscrapers down the bottom with the number of information management specialists. Uh, so if you're a large organization with a purple uh, blob, you're, you're a big organization without many uh, information management staff. Um, low numbers of specialist staff might be a plausible uh, approach for a very small organization or we've got a very simple information uh, environment, but we think it's risky for for big organizations to try to get away without specialists. Next indicator um, is a, a red one. It's declining between the two years, not, not statistically by, by much, um, but we think um, the identification of high value and high risk information matters uh, because it's a foundation of, of so many other information management activities. If your organization uh, doesn't understand its information uh, through regular appraisal and tracking what is essentially the stock uh, of information through, for example, an information asset register, you won't be able to identify, as you know, the high value, high risk material, and you won't be able to manage it effectively unless you know what you've got. Uh, so this, this indicator has a, a red box. It's a declining uh, between, um, between the two years. The decline is small, as I say, but overall we think that the trend is a bit low. Just uh, an explanation there about the 1819 survey data, which said 64% had identified high risk, high value, and then we dipped to 36% in 1920. Slight change of question there. Um, so that's, that accounts for that uh, discrepancy, but we'll keep it stable for the future. Uh, so another, another, um, another red, red box, or I think it's for some reason it's just been blanked out there, but uh, this is the indicator about um, um, whether uh, we're meeting treaty obligations by identifying information uh, and records of value to Māori. Um, we think this, this is a fundamental uh, requirement uh, of what we're doing as government organisations. The treaty principles uh, of partnership, participation and protection under, underpin the relationship between government and Māori and we think these uh, can and should be upheld by um, ensuring access to and use and reuse of information that's important to Māori, whānau, hapu, iwi. Uh, it's also important to be able to have an information base to understand the implications uh, for not just uh, 
current business services to Māori, but the uh, uh, results and um, obligations that come out of treaty settlements and other agreements. Um, so only, only about a third of organisations there uh, managing to identify information of value in Te Ao Māori. Um, it is difficult, um, we acknowledge, so um, all the more reason to, to have it um, as an indicator. Uh, it's also difficult um, to try to address this gap retrospectively when we haven't typically designed uh, the features into our systems that we need. Um, so perhaps that downward trend um, between the two years is actually a, a recognition uh, across, across the system that this is hard and um, we're not doing it as well as we, we can or should consistently. Uh, now my colleague, a colleague Polly will talk uh, shortly about some of, some of the work we're doing on Māori metadata that may be of some assistance for this indicator. Next key indicator is, <laughs> this is hitting the button furiously. I'll tell you what it is, it'll pop up eventually, there it is. Um, is the active authorized destruction of information. Um, sadly, also a declining, declining indicator between the two, two survey years. Uh, we've taken um, destruction as the key indicator, essentially as a, as a proxy wider disposal activities. Um, <clears throat> so again, we, we know that disposal uh, is, is challenging uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, the bar graph there indicates, uh, I think, going from right to left, that as the purple line gets bigger, um, it indicates that it's even harder to get on with disposal where you don't have many dedicated information management staff. Um, there are other barriers, of course. Um, certainly, if you're a um, central government agency and you're needing to transfer physical uh, records to us, that has not been possible in the Wellington region um, since uh, 2017. And um, that, that is a barrier that, of course, we acknowledge and there's a reasonably large building project underway um, to try to address that problem. Um, more, more fundamentally, perhaps, uh, possibly even more difficult, um, is, is the work that we've, we've started uh, on a broad program that we hope will address the, the fundamentals of why the disposal doesn't happen in agencies and, and looking at what we need to change in Archives New Zealand, in our guidance and regulatory settings uh, to make it easy for you and the agencies to um, get on disposal. Next indicator is talking about uh, building information management requirements into new business systems. Um, just the note there, uh, the, the survey data between 2018-19 and 2019-20 changes a bit because we removed, a, uh, removed the partial uh, option the question. Um, so again, as, as you know, as we know, getting information management requirements built into your, your systems at the start makes things easier in the long run and bolting things on uh, retrospectively is hard. Um, part of your challenge, part of the challenge that we hope we, we can assist with is <clears throat> to ensure that those information management requirements are front and centre early on when system investment uh, is being planned and uh, when systems are being uh, adopted, adapted or built. So the, um, uh, the, uh, the survey responses are statistically stable, but um, stable uh, isn't, isn't really good enough. So that's... Um, That uh, brief overview of some of our key indicators obviously um, throws up a whole lot of challenges and, and opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit here in, in brief about what we're, what we're doing uh, at Archives New Zealand to, to try to address some of those um, challenges in a, in a broad digital foundations uh, program, program or approach. Uh, obviously, 
we are always looking at the, uh, the new technologies, new platforms that are constantly rolling out. Uh, 365 is the, the obvious example, and we've um, attempted to provide the sector with some guidance uh, about how to get that right uh, from the start. Uh, we're also thinking about um, <clears throat> Um, harnessing more modern um, uh, tools, um, regulation as code, data modeling, um, machine learning and AI uh, to, to add that to the toolbox uh, of traditional information management uh, tools and skills so that we can actually uh, manage information uh, at scale and at pace. And one of the other challenges we're, with and opportunities that we're looking at is um, moving moving into perhaps post custodial uh, uh, model, uh, thinking about how cloud driven um, approaches can assist with managing uh, large masses of information and data, and applying effective management tools uh, to it. So, so that's a quick run through uh, some of our. Um, key indicators and uh, some of the things we think uh, we can do about it. So I hope you've um, been able to fire a few questions into the Q&A. And I will pause now and we'll move on. So I'll transfer now to uh, Polly Martin, as I said, our Director of Holdings and Discovery here at Archives New Zealand. Polly will outline our Māori Metadata project and uh, what we uh, hope to achieve uh, in that important area. Over to you, Polly. Ka tēnā rā koutou. Uh, ko Polly Martin tōku ingoa, he pōara hi ahau uh, a te rua mahara o te kawanatanga. Ko tā mātou mahi he mahi kohi kohi taonga, tiaki taonga, a pūpuri hoki i ngā taonga tuku iho, hei rua mahara o te kawanatanga mō ngā tangata katoa hurinoa e te ao. Kia ora everybody. Um, am I ready to go, Grace? Is, have we got ourselves sorted and can you hear me properly? Kapai. Uh, all right. You go. Okay. Are we, are we right? Okay, then, sorry. I can't see from my screen whether or not you've got this um, slides up. Okay, so from, from this slide, you can see New Zealand's main purpose is to ensure all New Zealanders have access to government information that is kept in perpetuity. And I'm again, as Tony said, preaching to the choir. So I'll just move on. On slide two, um, we have a particular requirement to ensure that Māori are able to access the information we hold. We have worked alongside Iwi on a number of important projects so that they can exercise their mana motuhake. So far, iwi we have worked with include Kaitahu, Tuhoe, Ngati Rangitihi, Te Ate Awa, Ngati Poro, and others, and we are looking to assist the many more who have settled with the Crown. One shiny example of Māori Crown relations is our partnership with Ngatahu at the shared facility in O Tautahi Christchurch. And it is where Ngatahu, with assistance from Archives New Zealand when required, own and care for their archives. It's a great model from which we um, hope to move and to build with more iwi. Um, we go to slide three. Okay, so one of the, our learnings from these exchanges, and this is the problem we need to solve, is we lack the ability to make the thousands of archives with Māori content of interest easily available because historically, government agencies who have created them have really created them with Māori end users in mind. So government records, of course, are created to meet immediate business purposes and Māori are not often considered when capturing metadata, even if the content is about Māori or the decision making has an impact on Māori. So um, let's go to why a Māori metadata system needs to exist. Um, this is a historical example. Um, some of you may know, because some of your names I'm recognising as former colleagues. We hold a series of archives containing letters written between iwi leaders and government officials in the 19th century. And when researchers from Te Atiawa were looking through the archival holdings, they were able to find letters from their tūpuna and from them identify Te Mita or Te Atiawa. They were able to use these to assist in their language revitalization program. They were also able to use the evidence in their own iwi digital archive. 
And this is an example of iwi being able to exercise their mana motuhake, their kaitiakitanga over their own language and the content in the archives that pertains to them. But here's the rub. The file title for that series of archives is the inane government correspondence. And unless you trawled through the entire series containing hundreds of these letters, you would never know they were there. And Māori have been kept in the dark as to the content that these rich resources provide. And we want to assist all of our iwi Māori stakeholders. Actually, I'm not going to call them stakeholders. I'm starting to move away from that phrase. Our iwi Māori partners to discharge their kaitiakitanga obligations, but we can't when we hold the information in such a way that privileges the English language and Pākehā frameworks. And there are also particular restrictions contained in our legislation. We can assist though with providing improved access. And to fix this, we have embarked on an action plan containing five steps. The first one is the technology. Um, we, five of our systems have been merged into one that recognises and uses Te Reo Māori with Macrons, and this new system is now live. The second step, we have looked at a concept brief and work plan. We um, developed an initial concept brief to outline the issues, um, and we've worked with Metataxis to, um, to develop a work plan, identifying the pathway archives needs to take, and this includes a series of milestones, some of which have already been achieved, so we're making progress. The next step that we looked at was a pretty comprehensive literature review. Um, we've done a lot of research into Indigenous metadata overseas and here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We've interviewed over 60 stakeholders, including um, representatives from Te Mana Daruna, um, on data sovereignty matters, because that's um, a pretty important topic right now. We've consulted with our iwi partners who are at various stages of managing their own metadata strategies. And we've worked with some government agencies so that they can progress their thinking, but also so we can learn from you. And um, we've identified the te reo me ona tikanga Māori gap in our archives kaimahi planning as we're looking to improve our services overall. Um, we then um, approach the Digital Public Services Innovation Fund. Some of you may, may be aware that um, our project proposal was granted $564,000 to progress an engagement process and from that engagement draft metadata so solution based on those findings. So what Archives is proposing to do is to design a Māori metadata solution for the 7 million plus archival items we hold, which is a very bold plan. Um, we plan to build on the initial findings of the literature review by engaging from the ras grassroots to treaty partners and to data iwi leaders. I believe this is going up to the data iwi leaders forum in the next month. Um, we are wanting to find out exactly what is needed from our partners. That way we would know that Māori would have all the tools, well, at least some of the tools in their kitty to access the evidence of government in an intuitive and much easier way. We're calling this mahi a Māori metadata solution rather than a schema at this stage because we don't wish to preclude any ideas put forward by Māori during the engagement process. As we engage, we want to, as I said, draft design the development of a technical metadata corridor with our partners for their agreement. Um, we'll send it back to them to see whether or not it works and create a final product to implement. We also intend to share the findings with our other successful innovation fund bid, the Archives Data Lake project team. Um, it will inform the developing of development of tagging as well as share their findings with um, colleagues such as Callaghan Innovation, uh, Stats New Zealand and LINS who have expressed, uh, Land Information New Zealand, sorry, um, who have expressed an interest in working closely with us. Um, it's an opportunity to work together oh. on a meaningful <laughs> tikanga-led engagement with Māori to develop solutions that are Māori-informed. That's not all. We plan to use this business case to inform a future programme of work where we anticipate the implementation of such a solution. So we have a pathway from step four to step five, which we will anticipate will be over the next five years. It seems like a really long time. For me, I'm extremely impatient about it, but we do have to get it right. And if we get it done faster, then that's fantastic. I just want to present a, a bit of a um, case study um, of difficulty in accessing Māori records based on our involvement with the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse and Care. Um, some of you may know that our, the Secretariat who leads the um, government agencies who are involved in this Commission of Inquiry 
have just recently commissioned Ehi Research Company to look into Māori involvement in state care. The Haha Uri Haatea report's research specifically stated the difficulty researchers had in accessing the relevant advice in historical and current records. Contributing to that is how the information had been created completely through a colonial lens. Fano also struggled to access their records for various reasons. And we believe that without Māori metadata, it makes that access and use for Māori survivors even more problematic. And we know that Māori make up over 50%. Actually, when I, I think the data is that it's about 64% of those taken into state care are Māori. Um, we know that there is a need for government agencies, particularly gov core government, to have a way that identifies and manages information pertaining to and useful for Māori. And um, we've been involved, of course, with cross-agency activities with colleagues at Stats New Zealand on metadata standards. We're observing what's happening with Oranga Tamariki, possibly with the sharing of functions with iwi, um, the establishment of a new Māori health entity, and many of you have appointed Māori leadership to assist with your business. The evidence of some of the state care survivors and expert witnesses highlights a distinctive sub-theme within creation of information and data. Issues with collecting information where ethnicity data was not collected, for example, the 1983 investigation into official ethnic statistics, or where it was collected inconsistently. Evidence has further explored the impact of this deficit in data at both a system level and an operational level. Those impacts being on society and individual people and families. A continued lack of data content standards and ex consistent expectations in this area also has an impact on the ability of us as public servants to deliver effective services and provide quality policy advice to government. And if we're able to develop a successful Māori metadata solution for public archives, then developing this further to include all of government records could possibly be a likely next step. Um, I had a look at some of the questions that came in and I particularly picked up this question. And um, that is the one around uh, when is Archives New Zealand going to provide guidance on how to identify Māori information and data and how agencies need to approach its governance and management. Um, and it's, fair, it's a fair question and it's a really useful question because the most useful guidance currently seems to be um, material that's come out of Te Mana Raruna, which um, identifies how Māori would like um, information and data um, treated. And I can't answer on behalf of my regulatory colleagues and Tony's directorate, but I can offer some reflections if I may, and perhaps pose some useful questions back to your business. Um, if you're wanting to understand what's called Māori information and data, and I really don't think that's a good phrase because I don't think information has an ethnicity. But I would say, I would examine the nature of your agency's relationships with Māori. Does your agency have agreements already in place? What do those agreements require of your agency? What is your agency's mandate and how does this relate to Māori? Um, I would ask, does your agency have Māori specialists or a kaihautu role that you could ask these questions of and for advice to get a better picture of what might be useful and of relevance? Another source of guidance could be the agreements the Crown has struck with Māori to identify where your agency contributes. Uh, Te Arifiti website is a good place to find the records of those treaty settlements. Um, as I said in this presentation, part of our overall obligation is to provide access for New Zealanders to public archives. Then if you narrow that down to our obligations to Māori as a, um, as a quality Crown partner, it's around providing Māori with access to the records of government. And that's why we're embarking on this project to enhance access, particularly for our Māori partners. Um, I think that's probably uh, all that I felt I would wanted to say. Uh, no reira, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks, Polly. That was great. Uh, a few questions coming through there. That's good. Um, keep, keep moving through the program now, and I'll, I'll flip to uh, Joanne, who will talk about our 
ontology project. Over to you, Jane. Just wait a couple of minutes. I think I've just exited the. Okay, do we have the slides up, Grace? Um, Stephen? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Coming. All right, okay. So, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Joanne Koraman Toka Ingawa. I'm the Principal Advisor for Government Information Management at Archive New Zealand. Um, so, welcome very much to this overview of the work that we've been doing on in all of government ontology. Uh, for the sake of clarity, it's probably useful to understand what we're talking about when we mention ontology. Um, there's a slide just coming up here. Slide number two, Grace, please. Thank you very much. Um, so these are some of the standard definitions that you might come across. And as you can see, each one has its own particular perspective, um, none of them being plain English. Um, so without wishing to teach anyone how to suck eggs, we found it really helpful for everyone to have a common understanding of the term. So an ontology categorizes terms, objects, and the relationships between them. One of the applications of ontology that we're exploring in the all of government context is the ability to auto categorize content. So that's applying AI and machine learning, for example, and auto tagging. An ontology can do this consistently and at scale, which many agencies find challenging in the current environment for a variety of reasons, um, some of those being legacy information, legacy systems, um, lack of resources that Tony was referring to in his presentation and the pace of technology change. So these are some of the potential benefits um, that an all of government ontology could enable. As our information and data systems evolve in the future, it's gonna be important that we can bridge between the old and the new systems and that we plan to accommodate new ways of accessing government information. So one of those being, for example, natural language querying of information in the future. So specifically, these are some of the ways that an all of government ontology can help. So from an agency and archives perspective, the ontology can also automatically apply retention and disposal rules, which is obviously something worth exploring here. And that's some of the the ADI project that Tony was referring to that we're going to be talking to you about in the future. To give you an idea of how this fits into the big picture, this is an early version of the future data ecosystem as seen by Statistics New Zealand in their role as government chief data steward. This is an early version, um, as you can see in the top left of the yellow circle, if you're able to read that, Ontology and standards are part of the infrastructure. So it's a common vocabulary to describe the data and its relationships within the system. As I mentioned earlier, using an ontology to bridge from old systems to new ones is an important concept here. So it's going to enable our future data system to evolve without losing the old. And along with um, many of your agencies, uh, we've been working together with Statistics New Zealand on this is really a, a discussion of the current state of the data system before it moves forward for, I think, the last year or so. It's been a great piece of work. Um, moving on to the next slide. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, so what have we been doing? Um, last year, we worked on developing an options paper, which took us as wide a look as we could take at some of the options around an all of government ontology. And that paper is available on our website if you want to have a look at it. Uh, we took this options paper approach to gauge the demand, the support and the benefits 
as seen by in total over 70 different agencies, people and organisations that we talk to. We were really, really pleased with the level of support um, that we got. We included uh, non-government as well as government um, people and entities because obviously government is not the, the only user of its own information. There are also other people trying to use it. Um, we also talked to our overseas experts who have experience in this area. So an all of government ontology will be an all of government effort, not a build it and they will come type model. Um, and because of that, we were taking quite a close look at governance and sustainability options, um, exploring some of those in that paper. Um, so we've continued on engaging with stakeholders after the publication of that paper, I think in July last year. Um, and anyone who's interested in carrying on with this work, um, we've also been looking for opportunities to collaborate on work, um, such as the Commitment 11 data set that came out of the Open Government Partnership um, National Action Plan 3. Uh, we also built, to aid understanding and test some of our ideas and models, we built a small demonstrator. So we looked to model some of the more compelling use cases that we came across in our explorations and our talks with people, especially some of the ones around Royal Commissions and government agency lineage. So this is an example of some of the modeling in the demonstrator around the life and times of a government agency. Um, so that's a use case that, that, that we came across a lot. Um, essentially, which government agency was responsible for what, when, is a question that, for example, survivors of um, the abuse in state care need to answer in order to get information about themselves. And also we model some of the Canterbury Earthquake World Commission work where that was also a question that was really important for people to answer. And ontology can certainly help with that. So we have been working together with um, DIA and the Public Service Commission on the building of a data set around government agencies. In terms of what's next, um, we're continuing engagement, um, nearing the end of a piece of work, mapping our upper ontology and looking at governance and planning scenarios. That's going to feed into a business case um, that's currently being developed. We're also looking to use some ontologies as part of a proof of concept for data lakes um, work that we're just doing that Polly mentioned. So that's looking at how we can use AI and machine learning at scale across government data. And we're going to be using ontologies in that. Um, so that's about it. If you would like to put any questions around there into the Q&A, that would be great. And we'll have a look at answering them. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Joanne. Fantastic. So we do have a few uh, questions in the uh, in the Q and A, perhaps we'll since since you're uh, on a roll, Joanne. Perhaps we'll, we'll dig out the um, those related to your uh, to your presentation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one from from uh, Judith there asking, um, can you please? Um, oh, is it gone? Uh, can you? Please explain the meaning of upper ontology. Yeah, so upper ontology is what we're, we're using to describe um, the, the key domains that we think an all of government ontology would include. So it's a way of starting to map out um, what, the, what the breadth and scope of, of an all of government ontology would be. So it's, it's just really the very, very high level stuff. So, for example, you know, if you think about domains, health, would be one domain, justice would be another domain. And Judith, of course, conservation would also be one. Uh, I can see a question there from Leone about, um, I think it's about capability. 
development and yeah that is definitely something that we're looking at that is something we do acknowledge we've been very lucky um with this all of government ontology paper to be working together with some experts have been working with Judy Verno, for example. Um, and we do understand that, that that's something that we need to look at and the business case is going to be addressing looking at how we can build some of that capability. I hope that answers that question, Leonie. And Vanessa, the Māori metadata solution being built into the RGO, yes, I think that's a natural outcome. I mean, ontology in terms of enabling normalization of the use of te reo in government information systems is one thing, but also it's very, very powerful as you will understand. Um, so we're certainly alongside the Māori Metadata project and we're taking learnings um, from each. Polly would like to say some more about that. Sorry, I wasn't completely paying attention to what you just said, Joe. Can you repeat that again, please? Just saying that the Māori Metadata and the Ontology projects are working together and sharing learnings because we, there's quite a big crossover in, in what some of the work is that we're doing. Oh, yes. And also, um, the more you share, the less work you have to do, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but also, we're um, sharing with um, some of our other agencies who are involved in the Data Lakes um, project, just simply because... Um, there will be some really gnarly, wicked problems that will come out of that, I think. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, how are we going to avoid bias in the all of government ontology? We are increasingly concerned with bias cropping up in AI applications. Um, Paul, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think in the data lakes project, we are starting to grapple with that for this very reason. So that's around the, the readability and the understandability of the algorithms as they are created. If we're gonna use those, for example, to filter access to government information, then that needs to be well understood and available to everybody. So we are using that data lakes one as, as a toe in the water for, I mean, it's a much wider global issue. I think the Brits, for example, like they're just looking at um, algorithm transparency standards. So we're not quite that far down the track here, but we are sort of starting to look at those. So we do have that in mind. Yeah. And anything else you'd like to add to that would be would be very welcome. Okay, let's just keep working uh, through our questions list uh, while we've got some time. Um, Jonathan asking, has there been any further progress on digital transfer front uh, with regards to disposal? Um, the answer is yes, some. Um, uh, the appraisal, disposal and implementation project that I was talking about before we'll try to look at these uh, problems from a, from a fundamental uh, start point and obviously uh, looking digital um, as the focus. Um, more uh, specifically, um, the current uh, uh, operational level work that's going on is to um, review our, our um, standard um, uh, transfer uh, metadata uh, protocols uh, for digital transfers uh, now that um, the um, new AIM system has, has gone live. So we uh, hope that that gives us on, on our side of the equation, uh, better capability for uh, digital transfers, allows us to do some things that uh, Archway uh, didn't quite allow us to do. And so we're um, now that um, AIMS is, is live, we are developing the next, the next phases of, of uh, changing, changing policies and, and processes that will allow us to uh, make the most of um, the, uh, the greater flexibility that AIMS gives us for digital uh, transfers. Just uh, the bottom of the list. Um, 
One here for you, perhaps Polly uh, from Claire asking, uh, what are the consequences of adding an A oh, of an AI adding additional tags to Māori information? I don't know. <laughs> Is a simple no. answer to that question. Um, but it would be good to um, to find out. One of the things that's quite tough in a space like this is um, is actually there are a number of things that are quite tough in a space like this. Let's face it. But I think um, there needs to be room for some experimentation. I think, um, and that can be quite uh, if we if we can have some sort of space to be able to try some things out in a, in a safe environment and I think um, I would be referring very much to my colleague and our kaihotu for Archives New Zealand for some advice on how we might progress that type of thing. So um, I don't know whether that answered your question but um, other than that's a really interesting question. Is that, is that okay? Um, thank you. I could do with a jolly crystal ball to figure out things, actually. <laughs> let's, uh, let's keep picking through the questions. One, one. Yeah. One from Laura asking, uh, just to follow up on the Royal Commission moratorium on, on disposal, is there a plan to collect data or to understand how these moratoriums affect disposal capability of government agencies. Uh, at this stage, that there, there isn't. Um, I think one of the weaknesses of our disposal system is that actually we don't have, um, well, to be honest, we don't have a system. Uh, so we don't have data about the system. And so we can't really tell end to end what are the impacts of when part of the system uh, stops example, due to a moratorium. So I think what we'll do as we get closer to the end of the um, current Royal Commission generated moratorium and think about what we want to do with the moratorium is yes, we'll, we'll do some assessment of the impacts that it's had. Uh, but no, we don't, we don't have specific data at the moment. And, I, and uh, if we get any, it will only be a retrospective um, uh, grab of, of information. What's that? Um, another ontology question, Joanne, uh, from Jacqueline, is, is the intent that an AOG ontology would include local government as well? Eventually, yes, Jacqueline, yeah. Wouldn't be much use if it didn't, but we haven't got quite that far yet. I know the, the um, local government already have their, their taxonomy, which is, a, which is a really good tool, depending on how, well, how widely it's applied. But yeah, I think it, it would definitely be included. Right, just working, working up the list. Um, Michael's asking about um, the Norwegian uh, Archives Automation Project. I won't uh, embarrass myself by attempting to pronounce Norwegian. Uh, I'm not sure, Michael, about whether we've picked up on uh, on that project, but I'll, I'll take that back to the ADI team, certainly just to, to query that. Good, um, a good lead there, thank you. Peter's asking about uh, physical uh, storage locations. Uh, well, a follow up from the physical storage issue and whether there's a roadmap on digital transfer and preservation options, potentially uh, even a digital, digital first backscan approach for everything other than culturally significant material. Um, I'm not sure that's the distinction that we would make. I would have thought material that's necessary for accountability purposes is as important, if not more important than culturally significant material, but uh, what I think we'll, we'll see um, as we fix 
try to fix our um, appraisal and disposal system and we see the, uh, the final shape of uh, Archives New Zealand's uh, physical storage projects. Um, as we know, there's a, there's a Wellington building uh, being completed. There are plans for other uh, physical storage um, in, in, in a regional site of the Vin. Uh, I think that will influence um, actually the, the regulatory settings about how we manage uh, the material that we want to retain permanently. And there may well be um, digitization as well as physical storage options in the future. Holly, I think you want to leap in there. Yeah, um, not on that question that you were answering though. Um, I just saw the question that Claire asked in its entirety. Sorry, Claire. Um, so the question is, what are the consequences of ad AI adding additional tags to Māori information? And this is the part I didn't realise. Does that fit in with the Te Ao Māori approach to how information is treated? I don't think that the Crown has done sufficient um, consultation with our Māori partners. And part of the reason why we are going on an engagement process with our with our Māori partners is we want to keep the crown out of it deliberately to be able to solicit what do you need and when it comes to things like new technologies there are actually groups of Māori partners who have done a considerable amount of work in this space and are quite sophisticated in the way that they wish to treat things it's been able to come to an agreement about how they ought to be done. And part of that means um, using a co-production um, type model where we have them in the room at each stage where we're developing these things. That's my whakaaro. And Tony can growl me later if he thinks I stepped out of line. But that's what I really believe, that in order to know whether or not what we do and how we advance with the use of technology and tools, needs to have our Māori partners in the room to do it properly. Kia ora. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Polly. Um, so I think we're pretty close to time, uh, Marlene. I haven't addressed your question. We'll, we'll follow you up um, on that one. Thanks for that. It's a good question. Uh, what, what I'll do, though, is wrap up our session now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Um, uh, thanks to the, the panellists uh, and also to our support crew, Trevor, Grace, Mark, Chikaraha. That's done very well. Thank you, everybody. Um, hope you've all got something out of this session. Uh, as I say, we plan to um, uh, release the recording and the and slides uh, for, from this uh, session. If, if you have ideas about future topics you think we should be covering in sessions like this, please do send them in to us. Uh, at uh, rkadvice uh, at dia.govt.nz or through any other channel you've got, that's fine. Um, and do keep an eye out for the invitation to the next um, forum. Uh, so thanks. And uh, yes, as I said, any, any outstanding questions, we'll, we'll um, wrap those up and um, get back to you. So I'll close now with uh, Karakia. Tuku to Wairua, Kiriri, Kina Tomata, Hai Arahi, Ia Tato Mahi, Eta Tato Fai, Natikanga, Arato Ma, Kia Mau, Kia Ita, Kia Kore, Ahi Naro, Kia Pupuri, Kia Fakamoa, Kia Tina, Tina, who Tai. Tai, Kia. Namai. Thanks, everybody. See you.